This is PowerPoint lecture for cardi cardiovascular system medications. In this lecture, we're going to go over hyperlipidemia medications, medications for angina, anticoagulants, antiplatelets, and clot busters. So the major roles of the cardiovascular system is to deliver nutrients such as oxygen, hormones, and immune and clotting factors to the body and carry waste products like CO2 out of the cell. Again, the heart has four chambers, left and right atrium and left and right ventricle, which contract and relax in a coordinated rhythm. Simply put, when we talk about the blood circulation, the blood goes from the body to the right side of the heart, to the lungs, to the left side of the heart, to the body. So many cardiovascular system medications exist today to help patients with a variety of illnesses. Cardiovascular system medications make the environment left less hostile for the heart to function. They can increase or decrease the heart rate. They can make the heart function more efficient or make it less irritable. Lastly, medications can make the heart tissues less sensitive to stimulus. So when blood flow is impaired, tremendous damage can happen to our bodies. Many times this is caused by a blood clot. A thrombus is a clot in a vessel, and an embolism is a clot that breaks loose and it travels. A clot can form in the heart and cause a myocardial infarction or heart attack. We can have a clot travel to the brain and cause a CVA or cerebral vascular accident or stroke. A thrombus can form in a vein and cause a deep vein thrombosis or a DVT. Clots can cause damage wherever they lodge. Tissue plas plasminogen activator, ah, that's hard to say, TPA, and thrombolytic medications can be given to dissolve the clots. One of the main symptoms of a heart attack or myocardial infarction is angina, also known as chest pain. It's caused by lack of oxygen reaching the heart. Other symptoms may include sweating, pale skin, and cyanosis or bluish tint to the skin. Anti-anginal medications, they dilate the arteries and the veins, so we get more blood and oxygen to the heart. Nitroglycerin is a primary anti-anginal medication. It's given sublingual, buccal, IV, or transdermal. Sublingual is the most common route, and it's administered every five minutes for a maximum of three doses. If the pain persists after three doses, the patient needs to call 911. You know, one common side effect of anti-anginals is headaches. The reason being is that when we dilate the coronary arteries, we also dilate cerebral arteries. And when the arteries in our brain are dilated, it creates a headache. So always look when we're giving any of these cardiovascular medications or medications that dilate coronary arteries, look for headache. Let's talk about anticoagulants or what is commonly known as blood thinners. Do you know that anticoagulants don't actually thin the blood? What they do is they prevent clot formation by interrupting the production of cofactors that help in the clotting process. You know, a cofactor is simply a chemical compound that's required for proteins, biological activity to happen. Medication examples are warfarin or coumadin, which is O, heparin is given sub-Q or IV, Anaxaparin or Lovenox is given sub-Q. You know, Anaxaparin is called a low molecular heparin. And what it is, it's a heparin molecule, but a small part of it is missing. These drugs are marketed to be safer and they don't require blood draws like heparin does. So heparin or Anaxaparin, again, are given sub-Q. And many times they're given to patients who are at risk for developing DVT, vein thrombosis. Patients who are at risk may be patients that are on bed rest, patients that have fractures in the pelvis, obesity, recent surgeries, or family histories of clots. When a patient has a DVT, what we will see is they'll have pain and swelling and redness in that leg. Heparin, you know, may also be used not only for prevention, but for a DVT to help dissolve the blood clot. 
A side effect of these medications are bleeding. So we must assess for blood in the stool and the stools will be kind of dark and tarry, bleeding gums and bruising. Coumadin is usually given orally and can be a daily medication for individuals who have an abnormal heart rhythm with things such as atrial fibrillation. With this rhythm, patients have a greater chance of forming clots, so many times they're put on warfarin or antiplatelet medications. When patients take anticoagulants, we do do blood tests to make that these medications haven't slowed the clotting process down too much. I'll review these blood tests on the next slide. Lastly, you know, there are antidotes for these medicines. With warfarin or coumadin, the antidote is vitamin K. It's kind of that hard C sound, so coumadin is vitamin K. With heparin, our antidote is PMS, protamine sulfate. A platelet is a blood cell, it's kind of like a starfish. They stick together and they come together to form clots. So we have antiplatelet medications and these prevent platelets from clumping together to form a clot. Over-the-counter aspirin is a great antiplatelet and it's shown promise in increasing survival rate of heart attack victims if it's taken with initial symptoms. I think right now they're recommending that you take a whole aspirin, which is 325 milligrams. You know, patients are also recommended if they've had heart attacks to take a baby aspirin, which is 81 milligrams daily to help prevent subsequent heart attacks. Adenosine triphosphate receptor blockers are another antiplatelet medication, and these can be used long term for prevention of clot formation. Clobidogrel or Plavix is an example of this. For patients on antiplatelets, like anticoagulants, they need to learn about signs of bleeding. Vitamin K plays a key role in helping the blood clot, preventing excess bleeding. So does it make sense that patients should avoid foods high in vitamin K when they're taking blood thinners, aka coagulants and antiplatelets? Yes. So foods that are high in vitamin K are your green leafy vegetables, um, cabbage, spinach, cereals, and soybeans. TPA, or tissue plasminogen activators, are thrombolytic medications that dissolve the blood clots. These are our clot busters. These medications must be given within 60 minutes of the onset of symptoms of stroke, and they can minimize, minimize the effects of stroke. Many times when patients are on these medications that disrupt clotting, blood tests are done to monitor clotting. A prothrombin time, or PT, and activated partial thromboblastin time, or APTT, and an international normalized ratio, INR, these are our common blood tests that evaluate this. Many times when patients are on antiplatelet medications, we also want to look at those platelet counts too. On the other side of the coin, we have antifibrinolytics, and these medications help to form a clot when patients are hemorrhaging. Aminocoproic acid is an example of one of these medications. Hematopoietic stimulant medications stimulate the growth of blood cells. These medications are used to treat anemia, low blood iron levels, and patients on chemotherapy. Now, chemotherapy patients, they have lowered blood levels, and this is because of the bone marrow suppression that's caused from the chemotherapy. Examples of these medications are ferrous sulfate, vitamin B12, and filgastrin or Neupogen. Let's quickly review shock. Okay, with shock, the cardiovascular system collapses. This affects every portion of the body. The metabolism slows, urine output decreases, blood pressure lowers, heart rate increases, respirations become rapid and shallow, and the patient can have anxiety, confusion, lethargy, and restlessness. To treat shock, we target the underlying cause. Vasopressors are commonly used to increase the pressure, which can be epinephrine, norepinephrine, or levofed. Remember, these are adrenergic medications. 
Our livers naturally make cholesterol, and cholesterol is critical for normal cell function, but too much cholesterol in the blood, it can cause a buildup of plaque on the walls of the arteries. This buildup can eventually cause the arteries to narrow or harden. This sets it up for blood clots. When we're talking about lipids or fats, that's the same thing. Not all are the same. High density lipids or HDL, these are our healthy lipids. They clean out our blood vessels. Low density lipids or our lousy lipids, they deposit fat in the vessels. And then we have our very low density lipids or our very lousy lipids. These actually wedge themselves into the blood vessel walls. You know, lifestyle change, such as smoking cessation, decreasing dietary fats, exercise and maintaining a healthy weight. This is always the first and best option for anybody with high cholesterol, but when it's not enough, HMG COA reductase inhibitors are first line of defense for high cholesterol. These drugs, which end in statin, block the action of the liver enzyme, HMG COA, responsible for producing cholesterol. Some examples are atrovastatin or Lipitor, semivastatin or Zocor, and side effects of these meds, I think of HMG, just like the drug class. So H is for hepatoxicity or liver damage. That can happen with these medications. Blood draws are usually done to evaluate liver enzymes, and they're done at intervals to make sure the liver is handling these medications okay. We may also see jaundice skin or yellowing skin when a liver is involved. M stands for myalgia or muscle pain. This is a common side effect. Lastly, the G stands for girls that are pregnant. This medication is a category X and must not be given to pregnant women. Bile acid sequestrates and fibric acid derivatives, these are other pharmaceutical classes of drugs that treat hyperlipidemia, but our HMG COA reductase inhibitors or statins are first line of defense when medications are involved in treating cholesterol. Well, that wraps up part one of the cardiovascular system medications. Part two will go over mostly our antihypertensives, including diuretics.